We're so glad you've joined us today on Our Jewish Roots. If you have not been on YouTube, you're kind of missing out on something very special that is at this table right now, the Bearded Bible <laughs> Brothers, that you guys. That's and us. you really are Jewish. We need to let everyone yes, know. Yes, we are. You don't not only look it, you've got it running <laughs> through, your, your blood. through your blood. Yeah, very yeah. true. And that automatically makes us qualified to teach about, no. <laughs> but we know the Word of God. We, we've sought the Lord our whole lives, and we've been educated under uh, the, the great minds of the Word. And today we're going to talk about Yeshua's parables to the Jew first. A lot can be lost in translation over a 2,000-year period uh, and geographic changes. And our Western minds try to interpret something one way, but that's not what it originally was meant, was it, Josh? No, it wasn't. So let's go to a classic Bearded Bible Brother teaching on the parable of the ten virgins. <laughs> hey, everybody, I'm Joshua. And I'm Caleb. We're brothers. And today we like to talk about Matthew 25 and the parable of the ten virgins. Josh, what are you laughing about? I, no, nothing at all. <laughs> I'm sorry, I thought there was 72. That's a different story. Oh. Ten virgins are also bridesmaids. And many of you have heard the story about these bridesmaids that light the way for the bride to meet the bridegroom. They didn't know when the bridegroom was coming. Some of them weren't prepared with oil in their lamps. And half of them were shut out of the wedding feast. We know that that wedding feast is the marriage supper of the Lamb. And we've been taught in uh, churches that those bridesmaids, those virgins, represent us as believers. But what if that's not exactly what was intended by that scripture? The, the Jewish telling of the story really takes into perspective that the bride is the bride of Christ. Then who are those ten virgins? They are Jewish people. This is a Jewish telling Jesus answering the Jews when they asked him in Matthew 24, what will be the sign of the end of time and the end of your return? So Jesus was telling them, this is what you'll see. And so you have those ten virgins that they were called to be a light unto the Gentiles. We see that in Isaiah 49, 6. Mm. So wait, wait, so if the Jews were called to be light, to, you mean like witnessing? Witnessing. Jews were meant to be witnesses. I have never seen a Jew witness. I've seen Gentiles <laughs> witness and it's terrifying. They got signs and all kinds of slogans. It's, but no, I haven't. How come I haven't seen that? Well, I asked a friend of the ministry, Avi Lipkin, that same question, and he answered me and said, during the time of the Roman occupation of Judea, that Jews were outlawed from proselytizing, from speaking about their God to others under penalty of death. So the rabbis wrote this into their laws that you can't go witnessing. And so it still happens today that way. Unfortunately, it does. But we as Jewish people need to take that mantle back up. We need to preach to everyone, not just our brethren, but to others about the good news of Messiah that He has come. We know the 144,000 are going to do that during the Great Tribulation, but what's stopping us from doing that now? Exactly. This is the thing. We were all put here for a purpose and for a reason. And for that reason alone, we should step out and we should witness and share the good news. There's many different things we're called to do, but there could not be anything more important than sharing the good news of Yeshua. So, you non-Jewish believers, you Gentiles may ask yourself, what does this have to do with you? Well, you can take this story and apply it to your life personally. And it's kind of scary when you do, because you're wondering, when the trumpet sounds and the shofar blows, will the entire church be emptied? Will all the pews be emptied and all the believers go up? Yeshua says in the Bible, many will come to me in that day and say, Lord, Lord, did we not cast out demons in your name, heal the sick in your name, and do many wonders in your name? And he'll say to them, depart from me, you workers of iniquity. I never knew you. That's so what does it, making a believer, what does, it, what does it really mean to be a believer in your heart? Um, is it just acknowledging that God exists? James 2.19 says, even the demons believe God is who He is and they tremble at His name. So it takes more than just believing and acknowledging God's existence. You have to surrender your life to Him. Every part of your life, you have to receive Him into your heart and He has to be the Lord over everything that you do. Don't hold on. You're not a good Lord of your life. I promise you that. No one is. But when you give it over to Him, Everything that He designed you to be is going to come to fruition, and you're going to be a benefit not just to your life, but to the lives around you that you were designed to reach. This spinner has designed to stop, to tell me I shouldn't talk anymore, and I'm going to listen, because that's His purpose. But we love you, and we want to see you again very soon. We're looking forward to it. It's the internet. You can see us anytime. That's so amazing. Goodbye. When Dave and I started on this program and with this ministry, we had a lot of reading to do. And Zola Levitt was a pioneer 
in teaching the Jewish roots of Christianity. And we got to read one of his, uh, I call it a booklet, a, mm -hmm. a mini book called A Christian Love Story, which is all about the wedding customs. He was one of the first that was out there teaching it. And now you guys are carrying on, should I say, should I say the mantle or the Ooh, vision yes, of yes. the torch, yeah, right? How vitally connection. important it is to know that A, our Messiah was yeah. Jewish and B, he was speaking to Jewish people. That's right. We don't get that in the church. We don't understand that a lot. Yeah, and, and that parable specifically, you get a lot of problems when pastors teach it that, you know, we are the, bride, you know, the bridesmaids, the virgins. Well, I thought we were the bride. No, you're the bridesmaids. In it. Then you're cast into outer darkness. Oh, no, my eternal salvation is at stake. It, it causes so many problems if you don't look at the original Jewish perspective. See, today our Bibles are really, really fancy, right? We have chapters and verse numbers and headings and little descriptions in the side, but the original Bible didn't. So we have to understand when we look at this, we have to have a lens of understanding the Hebrew tradition that was involved or else we're probably going to miss the boat. Let's go right now to hearing the perspective now on the parable of the talents. Hey everybody, I am Joshua. And I am Caleb. He is my Jewish brother, in case That's you did true. not know. You know, guys, Yeshua was the ultimate storyteller. Such a good storyteller. I bet he'd make movies today. That would be totally awesome. Um, but I, I think most of his parables that he gave, the church gets wrong in their interpretation because they don't look at it from a first century Hebraic perspective. And Yeshua okay. said himself that these parables were going to be hard to understand for certain people. Okay. In Matthew 13, he mentions that. Well, in Matthew 13, mm -hmm. 10 through 17, he says, And the disciples came and said to him, Why do you speak to them in parables? He answered and said to them, because it has been given to you to know the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven, but to them it has not been given. Wow, people think Yeshua is being mean. How come these people can't understand, <laughs> but these people can? Uh, it was about who were his own, and his disciples were his own. Mm -hmm. But for the rest of the people at that time, it was not meant for them to understand the prophetic meaning of Yeshua's parables because evil would try to halt its advance. And we've spoken about this before, how God says these things in prophecy so that evil cannot know, but the children of light are meant to understand that. He's a strategic uh, leader. He's a strategic leader. Otherwise, they would have tried to stop Yeshua going from the cross. And it mentions that in 1 Corinthians 2, 7 through 8. But we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery the hidden wisdom which God ordained before the ages for our glory, hmm. which none of the rulers of this age knew, for had they known, they would have not crucified the Lord of glory. So there you have it right there. And I think parables, um, they have three points in each parable that we need to look at. The first point is many of the parables are prophetic. And as we've spoken before, prophecy has a three-part meaning. So you have that meaning uh, for the day, you have the meaning for a future, you have that uh, application for your life. Second, uh, most of the parables are meant directly to the Jewish people. It's true. It doesn't mean that you can't take that and apply it to your circumstance of the day. There's universal truths in all those parables, but it's directed straight to his own, to his Jewish people. And third, uh, the majority of those parables have to do with heaven and hell, have to do oh. with your eternity. It's up to you. So since Yeshua was so awesome, he put all these universal truths in there. Uh, we want to talk about the parable of the talents today uh, because it has an application for your life. But we want to reveal the true meaning and take it in context. Josh, you have a smoldering voice. You're a good storyteller. Oh, oh do I? Can, can you read us the parable of the I towns? can. In a world. Wait, no, that's something different. Oh, that's awesome. Matthew 25, 14 through 30. Uh -huh. For the kingdom of heaven is like a man traveling to a far country who called his own servants and delivered his goods to them. And to one he gave five talents and another two and to another one, to each according to his own ability. And immediately he went on a journey. Then he who had received the five talents went and traded with them and made another five talents. Mm. And likewise, he who had received two gained two more also. But he who had received one went and dug in the ground and hid the Lord's money. After a long time, the Lord of those servants came and settled accounts with them. So he who had received five talents came and brought five other talents saying, Lord, you delivered to me five talents. Look, I have gained five more talents besides them. His Lord said to him, well done, good and faithful servant. You were faithful over a few things. I will make you the ruler over many things. Enter into the joy of our Lord. Mm. He also, who had received two talents, came and said, Lord, you delivered to me two talents. Look, I have gained two more talents besides them. His Lord said to him, well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful over a few things. I will make you the ruler over many things. Enter into the joy of our Lord. Mm -hmm. Then he who had received one talent came and said, Lord, I knew you had to be a hard man, reaping where you have not sown and gathering where you have not scattered seed. And I was afraid. And I went and hid the talent in your ground. Look, there you have what is yours. 
But his Lord answered him and said, You wicked and lazy servant, you knew that I reap where I have not sown and gather where I have not scattered seed. So you ought to have deposited my money with bankers and at my coming I would have received back with my own and with interest. So take the talent from him and give it to him who has 10 talents. For to everyone who has, more will be given and he will have abundance. But for him who does not have, even what he has will be taken away and cast the unprofitable servant into outer darkness. There will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Weeping and gnashing of teeth. Silent That's how G. all these parables end up. That's kind of scary. So what uh, was the meaning of that, Josh? Is that, is that like saying God is supposed to call us to be capitalists? That we're just supposed yes. to play the stock market and make money? If you don't <laughs> buy stock in Apple, you okay. will not make God happy. Well, one of the interpretations we hear in the that. church is that talents means really talent. That is a gifting that God gave you. You're supposed to use that gifting to bring in more people to the kingdom. And then he'll, he'll say, you're faithful with that gifting, with that anointing I called you to. And he's going he's gonna to multiply that. Even though the word talent in English didn't come about until hundreds of years later. And the Hebrew word talent was like a denomination of money. That's what the modern church thinks. But that is not exactly the interpretation uh, that we're supposed to be looking at here. But it's not, it's not a bad approach. I mean, you can use that because it's a universal truth. If you're faithful with something, aren't you going to be blessed? Yeah, that's a good principle to by. Okay, but so to, what does it mean then? So to look at this in context, we have to understand that this parable is a part of an entire address starting at Matthew 24. Yes, that same address when his disciples came to Yeshua and they said, what is the sign of the end of the age? What is the sign of your second coming and return? And yes, he goes through all the wars, rumors of wars and raptures and judgments and all that which we've spoken about many times before. He gets to the parable of the ten virgins. And immediately after that parable, he gets to the parable of the talents. And this is very important to understand because it's all prefaced with, and the kingdom of heaven is like. So it's talking about this millennial reign, this age of the kingdom that happens at the end of the tribulation. And thus, uh, Christians have had a hard time when they try to apply this to the church because they get to the third servant, if he's a Christian, and he's thrown into hellfire. So okay. could it really be that, that this is the church? Can we really apply it that way? I don't believe so because this is to the Jewish people and the entire parable is a judgment. It is the judgment of the sheep and goats. That's it. What? That's what this parable means. The judgment of the sheep and goats. I'm going to prove it. Okay. Nobody's ever proved it to me before. <laughs> prove away, young man. Okay. So uh, the judgment of the sheep and goats, this concerns Israel during the time period of the law, during the time period of the tribulation. And we see the harshness of that time period played out where it's according to works mm. that you are judged. And so the right. time of the law was a heavy time. It was a time where you're judged according to actions and works. And such as with the tribulation, that heaviness, you're suffering. Are you going to die for Yeshua or are you going to take that reprieve through the mark of a beast? And it's very interesting. We get to the servant and he said, I knew you to be a hard man. He was understanding that this this master, who is Yeshua, was the master, uh, not during the age of grace, the suffering servant, the lamb that was slain. This is the roaring lion. This is the lion of the tribe of Judah. This is the one that rules with a rod and the iron. It's harsh. It's a harsh judgment. He said, I knew you to be a harsh man. It, that's your typical Jew. Oh, yes, so, God, why did you do this? I'm not, why are you making me deal with this stuff? He understood. That's that Jewish interpretation. That's your Jewish history. accent? Yes, that's my Jewish. Guys, the conclusion is pretty straightforward. It was in front of us the whole time. In case you think that I'm grasping at straws here, all you had to do was keep on reading after that parable. And Yeshua, right here in verse 31 through 34, reveals the truth, the interpretation of that parable. He says, when the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the holy angels with him, then will he sit on the throne of his glory. Mm -hmm. All the nations will be gathered before him and he will separate them from one another as a shepherd divides his sheep from the goats. Mm. And he will set the sheep on his right hand, but the goats on the left. Then the king will say to those on his right hand, come mm. you, blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. And then he goes into a whole part, I was hungry and you fed me, I was thirsty and you gave me drink. And they said, you know, when did we do that? He said, as, as much as you did to the least of these, my brethren, you did to me. He's talking about his brethren. It's talking about the Jewish people. Were they hungry? You fed them. Were they thirsty? Did you give them drink? Then he gets to verse 41 through 42. 
then he will also say to those on the left hand, depart from me, mm -hmm. you cursed, into everlasting fire, mm. prepared for the devil and his angels. Yeah. For I was hungry and you gave me no food. Yeah. I was thirsty and you gave me no drink. Mm -hmm. it goes into works again, verse 46. Yeah. And these will go away into everlasting punishment, mm. but the righteous into eternal life. Is the same language that Yeshua gave through all these parables. Uh, Enter into the joy of your Lord, or go where there's weeping and gnashing of teeth. Guys, the reason this parable is so important is the gospel to the Jews. It's the gospel to the Jewish people during the time of the law. It's the gospel to the Jews during the tribulation. Uh, this is the warning to the Jews of now. You can escape all this. You can go to the age of grace and you can go to a better judgment, the judgment of the Bema, where you're just judged according to your good works, not judged according to the bad things. You know, did I make it in? Did I slip in? Did I get to the right hand? Did I get to the left? Yeshua loves you. He made a way for your escape. Otherwise, why did he focus on this ever so much throughout the scriptures and speak this in parables so that when the time came, you would understand? Our Jewish Roots is more than just a television program. See what you are missing on our social media outlets. On Facebook and Twitter, you'll find our daily Name of God devotional, current news articles, the Bearded Bible Brothers, and more. On our YouTube channel, you'll find faith foundations, music, interviews, the Bearded Bible Brothers, and more. Or find everything on our website, levitt.com. We invite you to keep in touch and join us on social media. Got to be honest with you guys, with the Christian perspective, I always thought that the talents was talking about kind of what we have, a little bit of talent in our lives. Yeah, but well, you, yeah, yeah. you have more of the talent. No, it, but no, But you're no. singing. Y'all are both amazing. <laughs> but no, but that's, you're sweet. But it's way more than that. Right, because yeah. we were taught yeah. from the Christian Bible perspective, perspective and what Gentile. talent means. Correct, yeah. and not the Jewish perspective, which is why this whole program exists and why you guys are here as Jewish yes. brothers in those seats. That's right. It's important that you understand the, the perspective, like we talked about, the Hebrew, the, the words are so poignant about what all the meaning was, and of course, the audience that he's speaking to at the time. Uh, and what we just saw, you, the idea that we could have our salvation taken away is something that's plagued many Christians today. Mm -hmm. And that doctrine actually, from what I've heard, is becoming more and more popular yet again, whether as a form of control, do right or you're gonna get taken away, or just a true belief. Right. But you have to understand that the dispensation he was, uh, Yeshua was speaking to, they didn't have uh, salvation through faith at that time. Mm -hmm. So that's why the, the message was different at the time. It, it was different and those people would go to a different judgment when they died Then, obviously we want a, a better judgment, the beam of the judgment seat of Christ. But this also I think uh, leads into Israel the fig tree. Everybody knows that Israel is God's timepiece and everything revolves around Israel in the prophetic end. So our next parable is about uh, Israel the unfruitful fig tree, I think it's going to open your eyes to something different than you were originally taught in Sunday school. Luke 13, 6 through 9, he also spoke this parable. A certain man had a fig tree planted in his vineyard, and he came seeking fruit on it and found none. Then he said to the keeper of his vineyard, look, for three years I have come seeking fruit on this fig tree and find none. Cut it down. Why does it use up the ground? But he answered and said to him, sir, let it alone this year also, until I dig around it and fertilize it. And if it bears fruit, well, but if not, after that, you can cut it down. Well, that's, that's the end. That's, that's kind of like a European ending. That's 100% <laughs> the end. It doesn't right there. tell you what happens to the fig tree. It just says fien at the end, F-I-N with a hyphen. All right, let's unpack the symbolism in this parable. We know the fig tree is Israel. It's throughout scripture. Uh, the man who owned the vineyard, who planted the tree, is the father. The man who tended for three years to that fig tree is Yeshua. Mm. He ministered for three years to the house of Israel um, in, in they show no fruit. They still show no fruit. And if a father said, I'm going to cut them down, he's like, no, no, no. Let me fertilize it. Let me minister to them more. I'll even lay down my life for them. Uh, that's how much Yeshua cared about them. But the big question is, Josh, were they cut down? Mm. You know, or did they bear fruit? I think John the baptizer gave a similar message by, by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit that we can draw a comparison to in this. Luke 3, 7 through 9. Then he, John, said to the multitudes that came out to be baptized by him, Brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Therefore bear fruits worthy of repentance, and do not begin to say to yourselves, We have Abraham as our father. For I say to you that God is able to raise up children 
to Abraham from these stones. And even now the ax is laid to the roots of the trees. Therefore, every tree which does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. So that's like literally the same message. Bear fruits worthy for repentance. That's what he's trying to say, a repentant heart here. Um, and I'm sad to say, guys, Israel the fig tree was cut down in 70 AD when Titus came in. Jerusalem was destroyed, the temple was destroyed. The Jewish people went to diaspora. You know, they were scattered amongst all the nations. Uh, and Yeshua himself forewarned this when he cursed a fig tree one time. It was kind of a foreshadowing of this event. Matthew 21, 18 through 19. Now in the morning as he, Yeshua, returned to the city, he was hungry. And seeing a fig tree by the road, he came to it and found nothing on it but leaves. And said to it, let no fruit grow on you ever again. Immediately the fig tree withered away. So yes. th this happened. We're not trying to be anti-Semitic. Yeshua or, got hangry. We're, we're not. Don't get in that way. We're not trying to issue replacement theology saying the church has replaced Israel and, and we support this. It is a fact. This is what happened to Israel. But when they were cut off at the roots, the roots were still alive underground. Mm -hmm. And over a 2,000 year period, they started to grow up to become a tree again. And then we all know in May 14th, 1948, they blossomed. The leaves came forth just as was prophesied in Matthew 24. Man. And Luke, uh, Luke 21 too. You always forget about the roots. <laughs> the roots were alive. Luke 21, 29 through 30. Then he spoke to them a parable. Look at the fig tree and all the trees. When they are already budding, you see and know for yourselves that summer is now near. So you also, when you see these things happening, know that the kingdom of God is near. That's right. Israel, the fig tree is in the promised land again. She has the opportunity to bear fruit, to be a light unto the Gentiles. We see more Jewish believers in Messiah than ever before in history, there being that light. And we know during the tribulation period, there's 144,000 that are witnessing about Yeshua being the truth. And you may be saying, I am not Jewish, I am a Gentile. What does this parable have to do with me? I know I'm grafted in to, to the house of Israel, to the promises of Abraham. It's a very, very simple moral and message that we can draw from this. Are you bearing fruit? Well, that was easy. <laughs> See, he are uses you all the words. I use a few words. I like that, Josh. Are you bearing fruit? Well, are you guys? We know we have access to the fruits of the Spirit, uh, but bearing fruits worthy of repentance, uh, how are you living your life for God now? Are you bringing souls into the kingdom? Uh, bearing fruit's not like you, you look at people and you think that guy's wealthy, he's popular, everybody mm. loves him. He must so be bearing fruit. fruits for the kingdom oh, of God. The yeah, he, he's good. He ain't got uh, no fruit. He might have fruit. But, but it's truly uh, the people who are walking by faith, the people who humble themselves, they're the ones bearing fruit. Yeshua was not... He wasn't telling you to act like the Pharisees. Yeah. All right. He, he didn't want you just to be religious and pious and walk out there and look at me and my fruit and, and purposely commit acts to try to gain the praise of everyone around them. Because they did that. They, they did definitely that did that. Time. And that's how they gauged. But when you see Yeshua and he talks about the woman who gives the two mites and says right. she did far more than anybody else She was else the greatest here. act of faith. And there's also the woman who uh, washed Yeshua's feet with her hair and with incense. Or the Canaanite woman who Yeshua says, I I'm not called to you, but to the house of Israel. I'm not called to the dogs. And she said, okay, I'll be the dog, but I'll eat the crumbs from the master's table. And he said, whoa, Stand. look at that faith. Look Stand. what she turned around and do. Yeah. And how about the Roman centurion, Josh, yep. who asked uh, Yeshua to heal his servant? He never met him in person, but he sent messengers. While Yeshua was coming, he says, I'm not worthy for you to come into my house. I am unclean, but I'm a man under authority, and I know when someone is under authority, you say the word and my servant will be healed. And Yeshua said, look at that man. No greater faith in all the house of Israel. That's the man who I want to be. Yeshua recognized those people bore fruit. We talk about this so often, and uh, the, the Bible says it too, and it says yes. that you defeat them by the blood of the lamb and the word of your testimony. Yeah. Your testimony, who you are, who mm. Yeshua made you to be and where he placed you mm. is where you have the most powerful effect and the yeah. intended effect. Mm. Too often we look at other people and we look at the Billy Grahams and all the other people and we say, well, I, I would never have that influence. I would never have that stage. I can never have that impact. Well, if Yeshua didn't call you to that, don't, don't try to seek that out. That's right. But like Caleb was saying, the, the cashier that's sitting there having a horrible day that you don't know what they're going through, oh, that you're man. willing to smile at and say a kind word to your waiter, your waitress, the guy at the gas station, the guy walking down the street, whoever is within your sphere of influence yes. that's placed in front of you, stop looking at yourself for three seconds yes. and see how you can be a blessing in a ministry and share the love of the Father with them. Yes. Even if it's never with a word, by your countenance, the smile on your face, you are making a difference. And that is the beginning stages of what Yeshua wants to use you for to change the world. When you That's impact right. them, they impact them, 
and it goes on and on and on like a Ponzi scheme that isn't wrong. <laughs> I've always been looking for a Ponzi scheme that isn't wrong because you get super rich. Rich That's in what right. you were supposed to do, which is bringing people into the kingdom. So bear those fruits worthy for repentance. Repent. Turn to 180. It happens instantaneously. The moment you repent, all things are changed. We don't want to be cut down. We want to follow Yeshua. And please join us next time. I do love some good Bible teaching, and I love the analogy of the tree, the fig tree cut down, but those roots stayed deep. Bravo. I love That's that. That's good. I am not a prophet, but I have this vision. You ready, guys? Yes. Of our whole tour bus wearing your T-shirt. <laughs> that Ooh, would be awesome. Bus, I love it. You know, this is a fun shirt, and, and it's not on my body as just a promotion, but it's a way to remind people and to in, get people's interest in the fact that they can check out Bearded Bible Brothers yeah. and all the other Our Jewish Roots programs online. They can check them out on our social media because the information that we're presenting is to educate you, the believer, and how you can understand God's plan for your life, how you can be better adept at witnessing to those Jewish people who have not met Yeshua yet. Mm -hmm. So after this uh, part at the end of the show, you're going to find out how you can get one of these shirts yeah. so that you can pique the interest of others into finding out about these programs. Real quick, I want to go back to tour. You guys are going to be with us on location everywhere we go teaching yes, we are. about where we're standing, which is so incredible. That's you're going right. to baptize and we just can't wait for our next tour with you. You're gonna to wanna to go on this tour for many reasons, but I'm also gonna be there to help you carry your bags. I'm a good bag guy. <laughs> yeah. I wanna wear this shirt. It's gonna be a fun trip. You, you definitely need to sign up if you haven't already. You, that's on. That's on forever now that you said I'm gonna yeah. carry your bags. I know. <laughs> I see all you packing the bigger bags and paying the extra baggage fee. <laughs> <laughs> you just mentioned extra baggage fee. It can get expensive yes. to travel. Mm. And our production, whole crew, our company, travels to Israel to film for you and to make new series. It is not cheap. We pay for our bags, for our seats, for the hotel, for food, for production, but it's our heart to bring to you the Jewish roots of Christianity. And I just want to say thank you for making all of that possible through your generous donations. Well, that about wraps it up for the day. As we like to say, Sha'alu, Shalom, Yerushalayim. Pray for the peace of Jerusalem. Help spread the word by getting your own Bearded Bible Brother t-shirt, either for yourself or as a gift for someone you love. Decide what size you want and call us at 1-800-WONDERS or go to levitt.com slash store. Join us right now on our social media sites for exclusive content. Visit our website, levitt.com, for tour information, broadcast schedule, free monthly newsletter, and online store. Our Jewish Roots is a presentation of Zola Levitt Ministries. Partner with us. As a 100% viewer-funded ministry, your gifts allow us to bring you our weekly television series, social media outlets, website, and other ministry endeavors. Please remember we depend on tax-deductible donations from viewers like you.